having said that, um, I would like to thank this panel for giving up its time today and for uh, presenting uh, on behalf of the different aspects that you're going to cover and to say that, you know, it isn't difficult to get people that look like this who also are experts in these areas. And it's interesting that at, at this very moment in our history, in our situation, and in the challenge of the governance of this country, we have our issues so highlighted. There's so much information that has been garnered from the kind of research that is taking place. So we're at that intersection of we know what is needed. And now we just gotta make sure that in the very near future, we have the capacity to get what is needed. And that, re that involves our doing what we must do, which is stay awake, stay alert, be ready to mobilize. But above all things, vote, vote. And those of us are in New Jersey, we get a chance to change the, the state house and to get rid of a governor who dismantled everything that was important to us. And to support someone who supports us. And, and also to elect the first African American woman as lieutenant governor of the state of New Jersey. She will be an amazing asset. To, um, to Phil Murphy, who I think is a phenomenal candidate. We also get to ensure that um, we elect legislators who respond to our needs. Um, one of the things that is very, very, very important to me is this whole notion of mass incarceration, followed by this push again after our president, President Barack Obama, uh, left the, the, the White House, this push again to contract with private prisons uh, in this country. So you know if you're trying to build an industry, which is what these people who are in government right now in, in charge like to do, you got to have consumers of that product that they're building. And so if they're building prisons and putting them in the hands of private companies, who will be the consumers of that product, and not voluntarily, it will be us. And so um, we got these buttons that are sort of floating around. Uh, please proudly wear one of these that says, end for-profit prisons. Because we know that even in our school districts, they, it has been known that there are young people whose experience in school has simply been their pipeline to prison. Well, we're about trying to stop that craziness right here, right now, today, and move forward and make sure that we're preparing our children for globally competitive education and globally competitive jobs. So I know that um, these panelists are going to talk about all the kinds of tools and the toolboxes and the resources and the lack thereof. And we've got a variety of people coming from a variety of areas. We even have someone who is going to talk to us from the perspective of the need for even African-American teachers in, in charter schools. Charter schools are going to be here one way or the other. Our children need to be educated by uh, African-Americans as well. So I can't think of a better person who can moderate this discussion than our own uh, Dr. Cassandra Jackson, who is an English professor. Yes, indeed. She is a, she is a bad sister. She is a PhD, and she is a professor at uh, the College of New Jersey. One of the good things that that college has done is uh, And her research and teaching interests focus on the African American literature, critical race theory, and visual culture. And she will moderate this panel and facilitate this discussion and give us an opportunity to Q&A. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you for being here.
and I need to tell you this, I hated my second grade teacher. <laughs> I thought she was mean because when she sent homework home from school, she always put your lowest grades on top and stapled it together. I thought I wasn't going to pass the second grade, but she was a black woman, and when she noticed that the sitter who was coming to pick me up every day was really not so nice, she called my mother and said, you have to fire her, which my mother did, right? And the third grade teacher was also a black woman. And she made me laugh because she, she would just casually like move her wig around like a hat when she was in class. And she just didn't care, right? She was about teaching, right? And she didn't care about the, the hair, you know? And she also told a librarian uh, that I was reading above level and that I needed to be able to check out any book that I wanted from that library, right? Um, by the eighth grade, I had this math teacher who was a black man, he sounded like very white, <laughs> right? He was what, what all the uh, eighth grade girls used to call fine, right? <laughs> and all the girls, you know, teased him constantly and flirted with him, and I worked so hard not to be noticed by him because, you know, it was intimidating. But he noticed me and he called the local newspaper and he told them that they needed to do a story on my academic awards. This kid that didn't say anything, right? And my ninth grade teacher, I promise this is the last one, but I know y'all like hearing this because you're teachers, <laughs> um, was a black woman. She's the smartest person I ever met. She's my ninth grade science teacher. Um, she had eyebrows drawn on her so high that she just looked permanently surprised, right? She, once again, she didn't care. She just put them there so it would be distracting not to have them. And she, she realized that my guidance counselor was ignoring me, and she called my mother on the phone. And she said, you know what? When it's time for her to apply to college, I'm going to deal with it. Don't even go in there. And she did it, right? She did it. Um, I didn't think I was that smart in school. And it didn't matter because those teachers did think I was smart, right? And I'm a proud product of public schools, um, public schools that have very few resources. I'm from Alabama. But the one resource they have is black teachers, right? And until, until recently, though, I don't think I understood the power of that nearly as much until my own uh, little girl started kindergarten last year. And she entered a school that many people would have said is so much better than the school that I went to, right? Because it has archery and a climbing wall, right? Um, it doesn't, but let me tell you something, it doesn't have one black teacher in it. And I'm about to address that just so you know. <laughs> but where have all the black teachers gone, y'all? You know, and it's like it's been 63 years since Brown v. Board of Education, right? This landmark case. Um, and since that time, what happened to all the black teachers, right? Um, in that episode that, um, that Bonnie mentioned, they talk about the way and the effects of Brown v. Board of Education, right? The, the, really, in some ways, it weighs the effects that we did not necessarily anticipate. Right, um, and I think it's Professor Vanessa Seidel Walker of Emory University has argued that the culture of black teaching died with Brown. But I think we really have to think about that, y'all. She says it died with Brown, right? Um, some of you may have heard that that podcast um, uh, on revisionist history. I know I heard it. Um, and even though I was aware of the issue, it's, it still hit me very hard because I was thinking about my own children being educated in the system without those teachers. So today we're here to really think about out loud about this, this problem. Just 7% of the nation's teachers are black. Right? You know, and even, even though study after study has demonstrated the power of black students having black teachers, right? We know they're more likely to graduate. We know that they're more likely to go to college, right? We know um, that this has something to do with the outcomes for our children, right, in school. For the sake of time, I'm actually gonna briefly introduce our panel. They have long bios, so if you want to see those, you can get them. Um, and I'm sure they'll talk a little bit more about themselves as well, but I, for the sake of time, I'm gonna introduce them pretty quickly. Um, Dr. Constance, Lindsay, can you wave? Right, is an education policy researcher uh, and research associate at Urban Institute. 
Um, Dr. Lindsay earned her doctorate in human development and social policy from Northwestern. Uh, her dissertation research focused on adolescent achievement uh, with an emphasis on closing achievement gaps. Dr. Rob Connor is the founding head of the school at um, head of school at Christina Sykes Academy in Trenton, New Jersey. He holds a PhD in educational policy and management from the University of Pennsylvania. His dissertation, entitled Examining African American Teacher Turnover, Past and Present, focused on the turnover and retention patterns of private and public school educators. Ms. Loretta Johnson is the secretary treasurer of the American Federation of Teachers, Go AFT. She chaired the AFT Racial Equity Task Force, which I understand was sort of the first of its kind for a major union to do anything like that. Um, she started her career in 1966 as a teacher's aide in a Baltimore elementary school where she earned $2.25 an hour. <laughs> so you won't be surprised uh, that she organized a union, uh, the Baltimore Teachers Union. <laughs> Dr. Ashley Griffin is Interim Director of P-12 Research at the Education Trust, which is a, a national nonprofit advocacy organization that promotes high academic achievement, um, particularly for all students, but particularly for uh, students of color and low-income students. Dr. Griffin conducts research on how to raise achievement and closing gaps for students of color and low-income students. Her doctorate and master's degree are in developmental psychology with a concentration in educational psychology from Howard University. All right. All right. Um, Mr. Frederick Ingram, way back, okay. <laughs> is vice president for the Florida Education Association, making him the organization's first minority officer. FBA represents 140,000 union members uh, from the Florida Keys to the Panhandle of Florida. He is also a vice president for the AFT, American Federation of Teachers. He is currently working on his doctorate in education. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Becky Pringle is vice president. <laughs> You sound like you all already know her, but <laughs> she's the vice president of the National Education Association. She's also she's also a middle school science teacher for 31 years in the classroom. Yeah, she has served. <laughs> she served on the board of directors for NEA and the Pennsylvania State Education Association, as well as I believe she was also on uh, President Obama's advisory commission on educational excellence for African Americans, right? <laughs> Mr. Andrew McRae is the Education Director of KIPP Tulsa Public Charter Schools in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where he served as principal for five years. Uh, Mr. McRae has served as the Dean of Instruction, Math Teacher, Grade Level Chair, and Math Department Chair in both public and charter schools. It's interesting you have a view of both sides. He's, um, he's received his BA in Political Science from Hampton University. Right? And his MA in education from the University of St. Thomas in Houston. He is currently pursuing a doctorate in educational administration from the University of Oklahoma. Okay. Ms. LeFleur, Ms. Naomi Johnson LeFleur? Yes. There she is. <laughs> Ms. LeFleur is a veteran teacher of the Trenton Public School District. Go Tornadoes! Right, go Tornadoes. For more than it is okay. yeah. so for more than three years, Ms. Lafleur um, has uh, is, she has demonstrated commitment uh, far beyond the classroom. She's advocated for opportunities for urban students and educator rights, and she has uh, served the Trenton Education Association as president for seven years. So, welcome our distinguished panel. disturb the, uh, the panel, so I just wanted to get up right now. Hi, I'm James. I work as the Congresswoman's Chief of Staff. Uh, the Congresswoman is too humble. When she talks to you about this little project, some of you have these pins on, what we really wanted you to know is that there's only one bill in the House of Representatives that was initiated in the House of Representatives 
to, and to make private prisons illegal. Yes. Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman is the sponsor of that bill. Yes. If you are wearing that pin and the congresswoman is not your congressperson, you should call your congressperson and demand that they get on that bill because it won't happen unless we are all a part of that bill. So I just wanted to clarify what this is. She's too humble to do it, but that's what it is. Hello, uh, my name is Patrick Ingram, and so uh, I am a teacher, a union leader, but more importantly, I'm a father. And I'm a father of two young uh, people who are going to college. They're both seniors. Um, my son is autistic, he's a year behind. Uh, they're a year apart, and so they ended up in the same grade, but they both are 
college bound. The hardest conversation I have to have with my kids, uh, my son and my daughter, is to become a teacher because that's all they know in their house. My wife is a teacher, I'm a teacher, I'm a high school band director, love what I do. Uh, but that's the hardest conversation I have to have with my kids, knowing uh, that there is a top-down, uh, bureaucratic, uh, do-as-I-say mentality from public policy, from lawmakers, from some superintendents, from those who are in power, who believe that we should uh, 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 educate some and not educate others. And knowing that this is a tradition uh, in our black experience. And so uh, the easy part of the conversation that I have with them is telling them this, that if we don't develop teachers and if you don't think about this as a, as a, uh, as a, as a, as a profession, we lose three things. One, black studies, and I'm not talking about a course in African American studies. I'm talking about uh, those side conversations that you have with Lil Johnny or Lil Xavier or somebody who just said, you just take that extra second to shake their hand or pat their back and tell them, hey, you really shouldn't be doing that. Hey, kids, you look like me. You better stop. That's the black studies that I'm talking about. I'm also talking about the black intellectual tradition because there is a black intellectual tradition that is long standing where our poor parents had to hide books to read under no light. There is a black tradition where I'm one generation removed. My grandmother signed her name with an X. With an X. She could not read. And those are the types of experiences that our kids need to hear. And the other, uh, and the last part of this is the respect for the black experience. That's what you miss. Now, I'm not saying or condemning anyone who is not black, saying that they're not good teachers. There are many of my white friends or other friends that are very good teachers and who understand or who try to understand as much as they can. But there's something innately different when you live, breathe, and work through that every day. My, you know, the hardest conversation, uh, again, you know, is with my kids every day. And, and what I tell my son every day is, son, come home. Come home. Come home to say, because my son is 18. He's got an S on his chest. He thinks that he rules the world. He's in the hip hop era. He's a great kid, but he looks just like any other 18 year old black African American kid. Handsome like his dad, cute <laughs> like his mom. And, but, but he wears it on his shoulders and on his chest. And by right, he should because you did too. And we did too. And this is his generation, his era, and he should enjoy that. And so what I want is a teacher who is culturally competent in front of my kid every single day, who won't judge him based on what, you know, how he comes to school, if he has a hoodie on. I'm from Florida. Trayvon Martin went to the same school where I taught. And so we have seen these things over and over, but that conversation as a parent is something that you can regenerate as a black person inside a classroom that nobody else can attach themselves to. And that conversation is not isolated to just us, but man, let me tell you, when you look like us, because see, I'm the kid who's the knucklehead, right? And I needed somebody who understood my knuckleheadedness and, and would tell me in that way. And so, you know, I didn't graduate in the top part of my class. I graduated in the part of the class that made the top possible. And, but, <laughs> shoulders every day. <laughs> every day. And so, I, I, I'll just end, end by saying this. I, I want somebody who can not only identify, but who can understand, cultivate, uh, give relevance and empower, and move forward. Move forward. Don't condemn me because I made a mistake. Give me a shot because you had one. Understand who and whose you are. Understand that we have a proud tradition in this country of black academic excellence. Even when we couldn't read, we were trying. Even when we couldn't speak the language, we learned it when no one taught it to us. The black church, our community activists, others, parents are the first and foremost teacher that any child will ever have. And we've got to get back to this black family and teach them that that's where it starts because we only get what you send to school. And we understand what our responsibility is, but everybody's got to cultivate. And it takes a village, but you've got to understand what your place is in that village. And everybody's got a shot to do it. And black teachers are a very integral and inextricable part of the whole moving forward process for our black kids. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So I can jump in uh, next. So I'm a researcher at the Urban Institute, which is a think tank here in DC. 
Um, and I've been analyzing K-12 policies for quite some time, and one of the things that I, I'd like to throw out there for us to think about is that for the past 10 to 15 years of what we'd like to think about as this corporate or modern education reform movement, we have lots of policies that have centered on teachers. So we start off with school accountability, it comes down to the backs of teachers, and that's had a disparate impact, I think, on black teachers. Um, and so I think it's really important because simultaneously to these uh, reforms and policies being implemented, we've seen the numbers of black teachers dwindle. And so when we're thinking about Brown versus Board, I'd like for us to think about some of the motivations to why we do these policies, right? So when Brown versus Board was instituted, it was to close achievement gaps. That's the same reason why we are doing vouchers, why we are doing charters, why we are engaging in a multitude of policies. But now we have the ability to sort of center ourselves and think about the ways in which black teachers might be um, negatively impacted by these policies. Um, you mentioned the podcast. Uh, he, uh, Malcolm Gladwell actually cited a couple of my studies in the podcast. <coughs> and our research has shown that having just one black teacher between the grades of three and five uh, lowers rates of dropout, increases rates of attending college, and in particular for persistently disadvantaged black boys. Um, so I think we have some really hard work to do as a community to think about the positioning of black teachers as we also pursue these other policies to close achievement gaps. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Lear, as a person um, that came through the system that we're now talking about. Um, in 1975, when the Elementary and Secondary Act was implemented, a part of it was called uh, Training and Staff Development for Teachers' Aides. And I was a teacher aide. And we set up a, what they call a career opportunity program that sent me to school, and I got my degree at Cotton State College. This was a process that was part of the Elementary and Secondary Act. They put money in there. And I came from the community, and I understood the students that I was teaching, and that I was serving those students. And this was a part of a program. And when we talk about recruitment, that's what we need. We had three, almost two million paraprofessionals now in these schools. And they are, most of them are African American. Why aren't we educating them to go on to become teachers? Why aren't we putting the staff development there? They're from the community. They understand the kids that they're working with. And they're already a support to their teachers in the classroom. And when I, I tell you, in Baltimore City, I must have now, over these years, from 75 to now, over a thousand of us that started out as teacher's aides and became teachers. And some of them are principals in the school. Some of them are supervisors that moved on. And uh, by the way, Loretta Johnson is a doctor. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. to that kind of recruitment. And when we put these people in our classroom to work with our students and don't give them staff development, then they're not a support. Thank you. 
hear that we hear the same thing saturated regardless of the part of the country we're in, regardless of where the teacher is, if they're teaching for America or they're a regular public school teacher or a charter school teacher, we hear the same thing. We also hear this space of being made to be alone, right? So as we have pushed around this legacy of devaluing and removing teachers, we've also isolated teachers in a way where they don't have a space in this form, like look at this room, right? To be and talk and communicate with one another. And so unfortunately for me, that's what I hear when I think about the legacy of Brown, when I hear my work, is I hear the hundreds of teachers I've talked to and their voice, and figuring out a way to elevate that in our conversation so that these teachers get heard and their work gets done properly. Mm -hmm. So, I actually think about, when I think about the legacy of Brown, I think about um, cultural violence. Um, you know, I stand here um, as a proud graduate of Trenton Public Schools. Um, and when I turn back my history, I had an identity and a legacy of not only teachers, but leaders of color, of black men and women who led my school, my district, my pathway through um, education. And when I pull that back, I say to myself, not only do we lose, I think about like the impact of pedagogy, right? Because if it wasn't, because, if, if it wasn't for Ms. Frazier, who in the second grade thought the little poor boy from Trenton who spoke with the list could actually overcome that and make me practice with public speaking on her free time in the room closet, right? Like that was the thing that gave me the gift that allowed me to earn the college scholarship that allowed me to go from Trenton Central High School to Hampton and proceed with where I am now. And I think that like that, this idea that intersection of pedagogy and practice is something we don't talk about. I think the other piece is that like we're, we, it's not one solution. There are structural elements of the problem, there are policy elements of the problem, and there's an us element of the problem. Yeah. So like, we have to say to each other, actually, how are we talking to our young men and women about going to college and being teachers? How are we valuing educators and saying, you know what, it's because of someone like you that things will be different. The reality was, as a school principal last year, I had the worst thing that I could have imagined happening. One of my parents was murdered on national television by a police officer. And I had to deal with the fallout of the family, the community. And you know what? You know what I thought in that moment? You know what I was thankful for? Is that I was a black man in a school full of black children who could speak for my community because I understood where they came from and I understood their pain. And I was also thankful for the reality that leaders of color had made investments in me to prepare me to be able to deal with that level of conflama. Now I'm going to be a little colloquial. But the reality for us is that we have to think about this problem in the multifaceted ways that it is. Let's address the structural pieces. Let's talk about how we have devalued the profession, how we talk about, how we think about, how we recruit and retain people of color. Let's talk about the financial implications, because the reality is, in many states across our nation, it is very hard to survive and be a teacher. And the one I live in is a prime example. And I would say the third piece is we have, to, we have to address the issue of support and cultivation and development. The reality is every large black man with a beard doesn't have to be the dean of students. Uh -oh. <laughs>
African-American teaching population. There's a couple of things that I think are important to keep in mind. Uh, since 1980, the number of African-Americans who are going into the teaching population has consistently increased. In fact, it's doubled. It's doubled. So the recruitment efforts that have been invested in over time are actually working. They're actually working. That's worth celebrating. However, the problem is, as that, those large groups of African Americans go into the profession, is more of our African American teaching, teachers are leaving every single year. Turnover is a problem. Retention is a problem. I had the privilege of working on a study uh, while I was in graduate school that looked at the turnover and retention patterns of African American teachers and minority teachers, and we found some interesting things. When you look at what impacts the likelihood of turnover for white teachers, you see a couple of things, and it kind of makes sense. Um, as the number of African American and Latino students in a school increases, the likelihood of white teacher turnover increases as well, and that's statistically significant. Can't argue with that. In addition, as the number of uh, behavioral and disciplinary issues in a, in a school increases, the likelihood of white teacher turnover also increases as well. That's statistically significant. Last thing, in terms of white teachers, when salary is adjusted, yep. right? When salary is adjusted, meaning when white teachers feel like not getting adequately paid, they leave. They leave. Now, let's compare that to African American and minority teachers. You see a, a, a contrast that's, that's distinct and interesting. African American teachers don't leave on the basis of any of those variables. They stay. Doesn't matter if there's an increase in African American and Latino students. Doesn't matter about the concentration of poverty. Doesn't even matter about salary. The thing that, the two things that push them or increase the likelihood of their turnover are very simple. One is about teacher autonomy. When teacher autonomy is reduced, African American teachers are more likely to leave, right? You think about this in the context of the schools that African Americans are most likely to teach in. We know that there are policies that limit the accountability and the control that African American teachers have on their classrooms, right? And as those policies have been enacted, the turnover patterns of African American teachers have increased significantly. The second thing that increases the likelihood of, of, of turnover for African American teachers is their ability to engage in the decision-making processes of the school, right? Again, and this is statistically significant, right? So as authority is removed from African American teachers, they're more likely to leave, right? This makes sense in some ways based on the comments of our, of our panelists. And so when you go back to post-1954 and you look at the deliberate dismantling of the teaching population, you gotta ask yourself, right? Are we still in the midst of that deliberate dismantling of our teaching population where there are policies that are being put into place that increase their likelihood in an intentional fashion? There's a couple other things I want to get into in terms of uh, characterizing the black teaching population, but I'll, I'll hold off and come back. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you. all of you for that. Thank you. this issue for as long as I can remember, you know, you read my bio, you know, 30, you more than that, 30 many of your business years ago. We've been talking about this forever. In fits and starts. We gather together and we talk about it and then we disperse. 
And I know that the panel is going to have an opportunity to share with you some of our thinking about solutions. But the real question is, what are you going to do about it? Raise your hand if you're an educator. Keep your hand up if you encourage your own children to go into education. Mm -mm. Oh, two, two hands. All right, all right. Give her a hand. Fed, <laughs> um, we heard you talk about how difficult that conversation was. was I, I didn't hear the conclusion of that conversation with your children. Um, and I come from a long line of teachers as well. And I will never forget the day that I told my father that I was going into teaching. I thought he was going to knock me out the, out the window, Loretta. <laughs> He had fought for me, and that's right, I know. He had fought for me to be able to major in math and science, and so he dreamed of this, this black woman scientist. That's what he wanted uh, for me. And when I told him I was going to become a teacher, when, when, when he unclenched his fist, he's from, you know, spare the child, spoil the rock, spoil the child, spoil the child, there were tears in his eyes because he already knew what I was going to encounter. The lack of respect, the lack of pay, the lack of professional authority for this black woman who thought she needed to be in charge of everything. And I'm going to go into a profession where somebody who hasn't spent a day in my classroom is telling me what to do? I don't think so. So he knew what was ahead of me, and so he tried to discourage me. And that began many, many years ago. And it hasn't changed much since. So as we think about the beginning of that pipeline, we have to ask ourselves, what are we going to do to change that? I heard one of my colleagues say, however, that this is, not only, this is a systemic issue, and we have to address it holistically. Because it is the front of the pipeline. It is while our teachers are in the classrooms. It is encouraging and supporting them to go on to accomplish um, teaching. And it is making sure that they stay. It is all of those things along, that, along the teaching uh, continuum. It is, reaching, it is reaching our education support professionals and growing our own in the system. It's all of those things. And it's more. We know that elections matter. Congresswoman reminded us that we have to vote. As we look at the proposed uh, budget coming out of the DeVos and Trump administration, um, we know, I mean, I think uh, there's going to be a laundry list, but I'll just focus on the, what we're talking about today. We know the cuts to Title II that we use to incent the Grow Your Own program to incent the kind of professional development we know our, our teachers need, to incent uh, uh, ensuring that we have highly prepared teachers stepping in front of our classrooms every day. Uh, so it is about organizing. It is about voting. It is about running for office, is it not? It is about, from every, from the, from the local level all the way up uh, to the highest levels of this government. It is about us taking a look at our own organizations, Loretta, which you and I have done. We've done at the NEA too. It's about taking on the reality of institutional racism and making sure that we are the ones that are leading on racial justice in education. At the NEA, we have a policy that requires that we seat delegates to our convention that mirror the ethnic minority makeup of every state. And as we take a look at that challenge, and it is a challenge, we knew that we had to take on this issue of ensuring that we have teachers of color who are in our classrooms so that we can recruit them as members and we can seat them so that they can make decisions about the policies of the National Education Association. And so it is a holistic problem. It will take a holistic issue and as I look at you standing up in this session, I will say again to you, do we have the will 
to change what we know must happen. <laughs> We actually have a lot of questions about both retention as well as recruitment here, right? And I'm, I'm thinking about the response to your question about how many educators are encouraging their own children to go into the field. And one of the questions I actually ask about this from the, the, the issue of finances came up as well um, and salary. And one of the questions reads, um, economists of late are now saying that more and more college students are graduating de with degrees and having a hard time finding employment. Um, with the trend of, um, with, with this trend, many black students are incurring um, debt, right, in order to get these degrees, in order to teach. And then if you add to that hurdle the fact that you got to pay money, right, for this practice stuff too, right? Um, and what this person is asking is, is really, you know, how do you encourage people to go into a field knowing, right, that they, there may be some hardships um, in, in terms of income in the United States where things are increasingly getting more and more expensive. How do we, and uh, yeah, how do we have a conversation about that? And, and, and is that necessarily an, an issue, I guess I'm also asking, given what you said, Dr. Connor, I'm wondering. Well, I am an educator. My brother was an educator. My sister was an educator. My mother was an educator. And yes, I have two daughters who are educators. So I did have that conversation with them. Um, one um, is an urban, teaches in an urban area, right? And my elementary teacher, the other teaches in a predominantly white area, and she teaches high school biology. So they're very different places. And, I did have that conversation, and it's not an easy one, because our profession has been under attack for so very long. And I don't even think that the main focus is the college debt that they're going to incur. Because whatever profession they're going in today, they're coming out with this mass amount of debt. So yes, we do want degrees, not debt. Um, I think that the main thing that we're, we're seeing is that students are entering this profession and there are roadblocks that are put in their way. For some students, it may be the praxis. We can debate whether or not this test also is biased, like the majority of the others, the racial biases. Um, that's one roadblock. Now there are additional ones. If you don't have a 3.0 in New Jersey, GPA, you're not even qualified to get a teacher's license. Then they'll come before a board, and, or maybe they'll just be interviewed by a, a principals, a board of principals. And for some reason, when they get there, and we talked about white, um, administrators not wanting to hire black teachers. But I'm going to also say, in my district, the majority of the administrators are black women. They would prefer to take a risk on a white student rather than the black applicant. That's problematic. That is problematic. So those are the roadblocks. When I speak to my novice teachers that come in, those are the things that they're talking about. Yes, they have the debt. They're gonna to try to stay there five years so they didn't get loan forgiveness. And I understand that very well. But it's the other blocks. They don't have mentors that look like them. They've had to go the extra mile even in the interview process. And they feel like they're being oppressed as sitting there interviewing for a job. Those are the issues I think that we really need to um, address as well. I'm going to leave the, the, the stats to you, so. Right, <laughs> I guess I'll chime in very quickly. Um, so, so I think um, it's important to also characterize uh, what the African American teaching population looks like today. And, and we're in a time period now where the majority of African American teachers are actually young people. Um, they're increasingly millennials. And so they come into the profession with a distinct 
completely different perspective. I, I can't say that I'm a millennial anymore. I can't tell that lie. Um, I don't look like one anymore. Uh, I did, but I. Uh, but but it's important to keep that in mind because they're coming in with a very uh, a very profound sense of purpose, and they want to give back to their communities, and we so we have to nurture that. Interesting enough, though. Majority of our teachers are always going to, uh, they're very likely to end up in the most hard to staff, most complex school environments. And, and we have to kind of wrestle with that a little bit because ultimately we're putting all of our young people in the most complicated context and then asking them to succeed, asking them to persist, asking them to be resilient. On top of that, and, and someone else can speak to this, but I, I, I taught for 10 years and I remember being in my first interview and I remember the principal saying to me, you know, we want to present an offer to you, uh, but we'd also like you to be here because we think you can actually connect with these black students we have, right? These black students, who says that? Um, and so the idea that as an African-American male, uh, I think I was 22 at that point, I weighed about 153 pounds, because Morehouse doesn't feed you well. Um, and I was expected to not be an educator, but I was expected to be a bouncer. That's a problem. That's a problem. So we have to figure out ways to bring this new generation in, to nurture them uh, as young people, and to not put everything on them, not put that invisible tax on them in their initial years. So I think those are really important points, and I just want to point out from a policy perspective, many states are now enacting these raise the bar laws, right, where you have to have a 3 you have to have a certain ACT score, you have to pass that NTPA. You know, to the extent that we see achievement gaps on most tests, that is going to have a disparate impact on our teachers. And then if you're then getting judged for students' test scores and you're funneled into high needs and hard to staff schools, you're paying a penalty twice. Yeah. And so I think we can think about this from a policy perspective too. On the finances piece, I think Title II is really important. Also, public student loan forgiveness is also something that's on the chopping block, and that would have a really terrible impact for a lot of our teachers. So I think, um, you know, it's a, we know the relationships matter a lot, but it's also really important for us to be smart about policy moving forward. So, all of these answers, are, uh, again, highlight that we have to, you know, it's a multi-prong approach. A approach. couple of things. Um, you're right, the teachers coming in today, um, they, we, we've done survey after survey, and what they're most interested in are social justice issues. And so we have to embrace that, and we know that education, a quality education, is a right for every child. And if we frame it from that place, they will be excited about joining us in what must be a movement. If we characterize the profession from that place, um, they, will, they will want to join us. But we have to address some things. Um, uh, I think I heard a little bit about this uh, um, from one of the panelists, but you know, we gotta call this out. Teachers' pay has got to be increased. And I'm not ashamed to say that. We have lost, you know, when, you, when you compare teachers' pay to other professions, we have lost year over year over year over year. So yes, we are altruistic people. So when you ask us why we left the profession, or why we want to go with it, it's not going to show up. We're not going to say that. But it matters. We have families too that we need to take care of. And so yes, we have to deal with the debt. And yes, we have to deal um, uh, with the loan forgiveness. And we have to deal with the pay. And then the last thing I'll, I'll mention is, one of the things we really fought hard for in the passage of the um, Every Student Succeeds Act. A couple of things that we codified in that law. One is around um, um, opportunities. Uh, really going, going um, laser focused on equity and, and excellence and opportunity. The second thing that we focused on was empowering educators to make decisions. Those people who were closest to those children, they were positioned to make decisions. For those of you who have not been involved in the development of your ESSA plans in your state or in your locals, you need to get involved. We worked hard to codify that in the law. They should not be making any decisions without you. As we think about how we attract and we retain our educators, 
How excited would they be to know that you are clearing the way for them to live into their empowerment? That's exciting to me. I think that'd be exciting to them. If they knew they were coming into a profession where they could make decisions, not only about what happens in their classrooms, but what happens in their school, and their school district, and their state, and what happens here. If they know that they have that power, then they would be excited to join us in this movement. Okay. We have a lot of questions. I just like that. Oh, go right ahead, Dr. Johnson. Just one more <laughs> thing and point I agree with all the panelists, but this concept uh, or this new philosophy that teachers is a part-time job. That I can be a teacher for a couple of years and then go on to my stated what I wanted to be, but I'll do it for a global hour and be gratified. Teachers, it's a career, it's a professional career. And some way, and I hate to say this to Teach for America, it's a part-time job. And we have to encourage and instill back into this profession that this is a career. And when they set, like I heard, the 3.0 as a way to become a teacher, mm -hmm. some of us have been mothers and don't even have a high school oh, diploma yeah. and been a good teacher. <laughs> and so this concept that we've been letting go for the last 20 years has run down. Our students don't want to be teachers. The dignity is not there. The respect is not there. And so even though you are saying to them, and maybe they might want to, I have a granddaughter that I took through. She now is a resident principal. So we have to change the philosophy that's going on now and go back to our schools of education. Have you looked at them in the College of Education? And what are they teaching, and how are we bringing that back together? I agree wholeheartedly with what you're saying as a panel, but we have to change this philosophy. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Um, we have several questions that I'm combining here, and I'm combining them because they all speak to the same thing. We have a lot of questions about how teachers can intervene in the culture of their schools. Um, in order to address some of these kinds of issues. We have one of those from a, uh, someone who's a physical education teacher for 37 years, who's also asking, even as a ret retiree, right, what are the ways in which I can impact that culture from that side? But we also have, um, interestingly enough, even in, in terms of your conversation, people asking that question about how that works in our urban school, how that works um, in a predominantly uh, white school, and, and exactly sort of how teachers can begin to you know, really affect change? Are there, are there policy ways, are there structural ways? Like how do we, where do we begin with that? Because we have a lot of questions about it. Well, I would say, join your union. <laughs> and I'm saying that because, well, and I know, because um, I work real closely with them, and her team, um, that we are, are spending a lot of resources on providing our, our, our ESP and our teachers and our, our higher ed faculty with tools and training and programs. Um, four years ago or so, uh, our convention, at our convention, uh, we decided to uh, increase our dues and fund what we call our Great Public Schools Fund. And that is a, a um, a grant program where our locals and our states can apply to um, train their teachers and their ESP to um, start some of the racial justice work that we're working on, to uh, fund what we, um, what we call our teacher leadership and educator leadership institutes to try to get at that issue around making sure that they have what they need to become leaders within their professions. Um, and so we, to the tune of almost seven million dollars a year, yeah, so find your union and apply for grants so that you can begin that training process so that you can build those skills so that you can be the leaders within your schools and within your district, within your districts. I just have another related question that I want to throw in with this. Um, how can black male educators fight a system 
um, when we're often labeled as angry men, right? How do we force change, right? What are the ways in which how we affect change could in some ways depend on how we negotiate gender in these, in these institutions? I guess one of the men should probably uh, address that, right? So I'll, I'll start, and with all due respect to my brothers, I know that they will uh, add to that. I, I think that we uh, can effectuate change by uh, doing what we do, by st staying the course. Uh, you have to know your content area. Uh, be good at what you do. That's the first thing. And, and, and ensure that everybody understands that you're good at what you do. I went to school to teach music. I wanted to be the best music teacher, band director. We were going to have the highest stepping, loudest playing, <laughs> superior rated uh, group that it, uh, of anybody else. And I'm from the South. I'm from Miami, Florida. And so, you know, and, 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 and by the way, everybody did a shout out to their HBC. You always went to Bethune Cookman University. Uh, <laughs> So Bethune Cookman is not that important, but Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune is. And uh, I happen to think she's one of the most important figures in education that, uh, that we've ever known. Uh, and so I, I will just say that you have to stay the course as it relates to curriculum. Uh, make sure that you can insert where you can your emphasis on what's important. Secondly, it's your pedagogical practice. What are you doing with students? What, how are you uh, transcending relationships? How are you doing uh, different things? You have to stick to it. If a principal tells you that, no, you need to be this, or you, need, you tell them what you went to school for. Show them your degree. Tell them what you're certified in. And stick to it. And the way that to do that most effect effectively is to join your union. And, so, and I will tell you this. Uh, and I'm not going to administrator bash because with all due respect, I have some people in here who are administrators. And I think it takes a village uh, to raise a child. But there are people, um, you know, we have what we call in Florida CYA. Everybody's in CYA mode. It's do as I say because they told me to do as they say. And so that's what we're doing. There's no collaborative planning. There is no opportunity for us to learn and grow together, professional development that comes from the teacher that says, I need this. Because when you need help, it's taken as a weakness that you are missing something, that something's not there. And you just want to cultivate what's right. And so lastly, I will say public policy. And that's all about voting. Uh, who is in office? You, you must, must uh, enact your civic duty. Uh, as a black woman, as a black man, we must vote. We must get people in office. You must run for office. We must have more teachers who are creating these public policies, who understand, and who will speak truth to power on what's right. Because this you know, idea of black men should be this and should be that, I have never, ever allowed anybody to put me in a box uh, for any reason at all. And I get that from my parents. Because my parents told me that this is who you are. I named you, and, and now the, the rest is yours. And the world is yours. And we have to look kids in the eye and tell them that every single day. And we have to look our colleagues in the eye and give them the strength to say that every day. Because some of our colleagues are not as strong as we are. And so I, I tell people all the time, I'd rather be a lion for one day than to be a sheep all my life. So make sure that you stick to what's right. That's two, uh, I'm just saying. <laughs> I wanted to um, return uh, to this issue in a different way, and it's because I'm looking at a lot of the questions, and there are two different things that I'm seeing in terms of how to negotiate from within the system. One of them is about sort of how that operates in urban districts where there aren't as many resources available, right? I mean, we're, it's, it's so interesting thinking about this as the legacy of Brown. And I'm, I'm seeing this again and again in the questions, like, okay, how, how, do I, how do I operate in a situation where I really don't have the resources I need to do my job, right? And then I've got also some, some interesting questions also about uh, what, it, what it means uh, to be heard, right, when you're operating at predomin in a pro predominantly white space, right? And we're talking about people who don't necessarily have tenure in these institutions, but also people who are just tired. You know, uh, tired of being questioned, tired of, you, I see people nodding at me like, I don't even need to say anymore, do I? <laughs> so I'm going to speak to the being heard part. Um, when we talk to teachers, um, what we hear is that piece of being heard. So when you go into like a New York City, you'd be surprised how many teachers are still not being heard, right? You think about your city, you think about a lot of people of color, and they're still, my better, I don't think, you spoken. 
um, there's still people not being heard, right? And so what we find is that there are networks, there are powerful networks across this country that people don't talk about, right? So there's like the Black Teacher Project in Oakland and New York. They're as controversial as Boston University doing um, black men and black male initiatives. And so part of this being heard is reaching out to those networks and not being a solo individual voice trying to fight a system. Um, there are people on this panel doing amazing work who you can reach out to. There's your union. Um, so try to find and leverage those spaces because that's what we find teachers who are still staying, although fighting and trying to find their way through, is that they're finding it when they're not alone in the, in the conversation. The other piece of this is knowing the policy, right? And so we keep talking about policy, we keep talking about voting, but we also need you to know what ESSA is and what is in it and how it applies to you so that you can push back. We need you to know the numbers, maybe not as conversant as some folks up here are, but to the point where you know what's happening in your district. We need you to fight for public reporting of data so that folks like us can actually communicate for you and help elevate your voice because that's what we're here to do. And so some of that is about don't, don't stay in the silo. Let us help elevate you because that's what we're here to do. But we need to know and we need your voices to do it. And so pushing back and getting in, being a part of some of those communities that exist. It's hard to find them, but they're there and they exist and they're, they're absolutely a powerful place to start being heard. I want to um, talk about something that came up earlier. You mentioned that in your school system, that a student lost a father. And one of the things that I'm also finding in a lot of these questions, they're about feeling demoralized. And it seems to me that we're in a moment now where even if you don't teach in a school, you might be feeling demoralized. Yes. I don't know about you guys, but when uh, Philando Castillo uh, came in, you know, it hit me so hard. I think I ate sugar for like three or four days. Right? It was just, and it, it hit me so hard that I didn't even know what it hit me. And I'm thinking about, this is one of the reasons why we need those black teachers there. But I have to say, it's troubling to see so many questions. I mean, these people are standing in their truth. You've got to say what you've got to say. It's important. But people are, are feeling demoralized. Right? And I think that's... You can't really be black and living in this country and not be feeling demoralized unless you somehow tricked yourself. <laughs> yeah. So I, I want to hear, right, because somebody mentioned, they were like, okay, this has been our home. We've got this strong intellectual history, right? I want to know what you guys have to say about what the role of education has to play in that, this issue, how it's related to that. What do we do? So I would say, I would say two things. Um, the first is that when Mr. Terrence Pressure was murdered um, by uh, Officer Betty Shovel last year, um, we, you know, the. Can I hear you? Yeah, move that mic a little closer. Thank you. So when I said, so when Mr. Terrence Pressure was murdered by Officer Betty Shelby last year, um, it brought, it was a, a terrible tragedy. Uh -huh. And it, it, what grew out of that wasn't necessarily a sense of demoralization, but a sense of both anger and collectiveness. Because it, and then I would say what then translated into rage um, was when she got waived, um, which is the, the experience of many um, of these experiences over the course of the last year. But when I come to education, I will come back to three things. Because you asked a question earlier about like men in the education space, and I thought about that for a little bit, and you know, I'm a man, so it took me a little longer. Um, so the, the first um, was when I think about the role of mentoring. The reality for us is that when you look at the, the education space writ large, it is led, it is moved forward, it is powered by the engine that is black women. Now, when you insert folks who are saying, oh, they're, you know, we're looking for men, we're looking for men, there is a bias in the process. Um, you, you get this job because I don't want you to be, a, you know, we hear all the terms, bodyguard, connect with the kids, uh, dean of culture, whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> But we need to talk about pathways. Uh, how, how can I, as a person, how am I accessing the pathways that's gonna put me on the trajectory of school leadership? It's gonna put me to the trajectory of teacher leadership to be an advocate for, for my colleagues and for my students. Uh, and I would say lastly, 
we're not angry enough yet. Like, we can say what we want to say, but we ain't really angry enough yet. Kids are getting shot in the streets. They take it on money, pushing people around, closing schools. Yes. The most dangerous thing to be right now huh. is a black man. Um, and when we, like, we're not like fever pitch angry yet. And I think that is a part of the problem. And I'm gonna tell you why. It's because there's some generational gaps. I'm a millennial, and I'm gonna tell you right now, we, we think we're angry, but we lazy, and we just <laughs> like to <you know. laughs> Because what has happened is that you all have been fighting this generational fight for 30, 40, 50 years. I want you to be able to put the mic down, step back, and let me step up, but we gotta rally up for four or 500,000 other of the rest of us so we can get out here and make a difference. And that's because I feel like still, we're not angry enough yet. And I think it's going to take for us to be honest in our space about like, look, this is the state of things. This is where we have toiled to get you. And now I need you to take the next step and create the structures and the mentoring programs and the mechanisms to get us there. Otherwise, 40 years from now, I'm going to sit on the panel, share the same message that you share with me. <laughs> Because we're talking about black educators right now and our teachers and having more black teachers, but we need to take our school districts back, right? So when you look at our urban school districts across the country, they're being controlled by whomever. It's undemocratic. We, most of the time, we do not even vote for our own board members, okay? We have little to no control over who's being hired because they have state monitors who sit and say, I have control over the hiring practices of this district. We have to take control of our districts. So in the We Choose campaign, we say we choose equity not the illusion of choice. So in our districts, we, not to offend anyone, we are asleep. We're not working collectively to even address the issues. Because, I mean, with the Congresswoman, her initiative, <coughs> against saying we are against the privatization of prisons, we also need to say we're against privatizing our school districts. We need that very same type of legislation to say no, you're not gonna close any more of our schools, you're not going to play with our children with this experiment and say, well, they can learn better over there, no. We need to take back our schools, and everyone has to know. Like the young brother said, and I'm glad you went to Trent High. <laughs> like the young brother said, this is not a short fight. We have to get everybody in this. This is a serious fight, because with corporate ed reform, these billionaires see the schools that our children go to as just a way to fatten their pockets. And we're letting them do it. We have to come together, address the problems, and we're going to call on Congress, people in Congress, like our Congresswoman, who's fighting the fight and has not forgotten the community. And so for those who have, it's election time for this. Yeah. You. I also want to thank her for letting me do this. I am, uh, there is, um, she comes up, I want to say that there is a uh, phrase in Shakespeare's The Tempest, because you know I'm an English professor. And he says, um, Oh, what brave people are these? Right? 
right? And I just want to say, it has been so heartening looking out at all of these. Oh, and brave in that context also means beautiful. And it's just been so heartening to look at all these uh, black and brown faces looking back at me, looking like me uh, in this space. So thank you for this, and thank you for a lively conversation. And actually, before we end, I think Dr. Connor, who I also need to thank for the, the Morehouse man, he always got a pen. Um, but I'm supposed to ask you, um, you have a closing announcement as well before um, you mentioned some information you wanted to share. I love the way you're looking at me. They told me that. <laughs> so, we'll the, um, okay. so um, we were talking about networks really quickly. And the, I, I just want to put a plug in for the Black Male Educators for Social Justice Network in Philadelphia. They have a conference, I think, that's taking place in October. It's a wonderfully strong network of African American men who have come together to support each other, who are teaching in public and private schools. And I just would say that I think we need to extend that network into New Jersey and into Trenton. So I look forward to this. The one thing I know is that an hour and a half is not enough time to talk about this issue because this issue is so broad. However, let us give a round of applause to our facilitator and to our, and to our panelists who uh, have shared such insights. So I certainly have learned an awful lot here today. Um, let me just share a couple of things with you. First of all, I got a Facebook friend, I don't know if she's here, but she said, I'm coming down to the A, um, uh, the, the, the legislative conference, I've come down here, and then I stopped coming down here, because all they do is talk, and it's a good conversation, but then nothing else happens. So let me just put a pin in that and say, I need something to happen as a result of the conversation we've had today. And uh, one of the things I know is that there is, there's room for some legislation about supporting teacher aides to become teachers. But that's only one part of the piece, so I need to be able to have access to you all and to some of you out here, because we need to think about legislating some of this discussion that we had, putting together this package, and it may not go that far with this in the White House right now, but there's no reason for us not to be ready, because a change is coming. I agree with 1,555% is that we got to get control of our school districts again. The state of New Jersey has a history of taking over school districts, but it has no history of improving them. <laughs> so let us talk about the movement. Let us talk to the gubernatorial candidates and ask them, what's your vision of how we localize our and empower our teachers? See, I think teachers and nurses are the most underappreciated uh, professionals in our, in, in our communities. And the thing about teachers, y'all are more important because because of you, we've got doctors, lawyers, Indian chiefs, and you know what else. Had it not been for you all, we would not be this. So we need to be talking about things that we should be doing legislatively and policy perspective that empower you to do what you need to do. We need to be talking about all of you out here that I know that spent 20 and 30 years in education, loved it, committed to it. Now that you're retired, what can we get you to do? And how do we create an organ for you to be able to do that? Because there's so many children that need the benefit of your brilliance and your commitment. So I pledge to you that we will follow up and that we will create some legislative responses to some of the things that we've heard today. I am grateful to you for raising some of these very, very tough and honest issues. I'm grateful that you talk up to us about the fact that in some respects, we are the problem and we need to be able to confront that wherever it is because we have a responsibility to stand up for those who need us the most, and those are the children that we want out here in colleges, not in prisons. Okay. And not in prisons.
So I thank you for taking this hour and a half. Um, I promise you we will, we will be moving forward, and I, you all need to know that I am very grateful to have been in your presence and to hear the things that you have on your mind. And so from the national level to the state level to the local level, we've had some experiences today that have enriched uh, our being here. Thank you and God bless you.